Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University, and this is part four of our epic beam column design example. And um, so far, we have gotten as far as to choose a trial section. And it has only taken us three videos to get to this point. Okay, so um, we have looked at the load combinations. We've looked at the loads. We have thought about the axial moment interaction and made sure that this makes sense for that. We have thought about deflections and we have considered eccentricity of the load at the top causing moment. We've considered the moment causing bending, which is the loads coming laterally on the beam. And um, we have managed to choose a trial section by using the design tables. So now that we've done all that, we're done with the design tables. We have our trial section. We're going to go through, we're going to check shear, moment, bearing, deflection, and finally our uh, axial moment uh, interaction. Um, and we're not going to be able to do that in just one video, but we'll probably do it over at least a couple. If you haven't watched the previous videos, then you are going to be completely lost. So go back to the beginning and uh, start there. Just for context, remember that this is our design condition. We're looking at a um, beam column. We have eccentric axial load at the top, which causes some moment as well as axial load and also some shear. And we have lateral loads of 30 kilonewtons coming from some window mullions, which are providing a direct bending to the beam column. So we have beam from the bending and column from the axial load. Okay, so now what we've done is we've managed to pick a trial section. We have said, let's try a 175 by 304 spruce pine 20F EX member. So we've looked at all the load combinations and we will recall as well that this is a spruce pine 20F-EX. So it's the balanced one and we're gonna check now and make sure that this works for everything. Uh, the first thing that I'm gonna do is get all of my um, geometry and uh, modification factors and my um, strengths. And to save time, I'm just gonna write them out. Um, I think if you've watched uh, the other videos, you know how to get these values by now. So I'm not gonna go to the tables individually and get them one by one. Okay, so our B is 175. So this is the size of our member. Our D is 304. Okay, our gross area, which is 175 by 304, equals 53,200 millimeters squared. Our net area we will calculate later when we're talking about the notch. Okay, our S, which is our section modulus, is BD squared over six, which comes out to 2695 times 10 to the three millimeters cubed. Our I, our moment of inertia, which of course is BD cubed over 12, comes out to 409 times 10 to the six millimeters to the fourth. Okay, we're getting there. What about our K values? Okay, so KD varies, okay, depending on uh, load combination. So we know that we have load combinations for all the three KD factors, 0.65, 1.0, and 1.15. So we will have to find each resistance for each of those KD values so that we can check them. Um, our KH is 1.0. We don't have any system effect happening here. Our KS, all of our KSs, KSB, KSF, KSV, KSC, KSCP, KT, sorry, KST, KSE, they're all equals one because we're in um, dry conditions. Okay, and our KT is also equal one. So we're untreated in dry conditions. Now I'm gonna go to table 7.3, or if you're working in 086.19, that would be table 7.2, and I'm gonna get all of my strength values and we're checking basically everything. So you can just go to that table and read down all of the different values for this grade of glue lamb. This is my FB. 
Okay, and then I have my FC for compression, but also my FCB, which is for combined compression and bending. And um, so when I do my interaction equations, I'm supposed to calculate PR using this FCB instead of this FC. Um, but if you go to the table, you'll see that um, I think all of them or almost all of them uh, are the same for FC and FCB. So just pointing that out. So I'm just going to do it with FC. It's going to be the same as if I do it with FCB. So when I do my interaction checks, my PR uh, is still valid. Okay, because FC and FCB are the same. You can go back to the um, beam column description video to see what I'm talking about in a little bit more detail. FCP, which is compression perpendicular for our bearing check. And we do have some tension as well. So we're going to need our net tension and gross tension strengths. In addition, we're going to need our Young's modulus and also our fifth percentile Young's modulus or whenever we're doing a calculation that involves strength, like when we do compression strength, we're going to need our EO5. And our E is something that we would use for um, deflection, for example. Okay, so that's everything. This is our trial section. Okay, and it's a 175 by 304. And these are all of the different parameters that we're going to need. So I'm going to refer back to these um, as we go. Okay. So on to the first check. Okay, so the only thing that we haven't checked so far is our shear with notches. So we have a kind of check on the shear from the design tables. We have our check on the moment from the design tables. We've looked at our axial strength using the design tables. We're gonna do the detailed checks for that as well. But what we haven't really checked yet is what's gonna happen um, due to the effect of the compression side notches. Okay, so here's my beam. Here is the way that my beam is bending. So it's gonna be in compression on this side and tension on this side. When it bends like that, Therefore, these notches here are compression side notches, and they are 400 millimeters long and 0.2 d wide, which is 0.2 times the depth of our section, which is 304. So let's start with our regular longitudinal shear resistance check. So I'm gonna start with the simplified method because it's easier. Let's first check if we can use the simplified method. So I need to find my area, my volume, which is B times D times L, right? So that's um, 175 by 304 times 3000. And I get 0 0.16 meters cubed. So that's less than 2.0 meters cubed. So therefore I can use the simplified method. Can use the simplified method. Okay, so I need my phi is 0 0.9 for this, my capital FV, which is 1.75 times, I'm just going to start with KD of 1, so 1, S, uh, H, S, and T, so I have 1.75 MPA. And then I'm going to calculate my shear resistance, so this is my VR we're going to call this VR standard, which is for standard term load. And you remember the equation looks like this, 2 over 3 gross area. And that gives us 0 0.9. Okay, so if I do that calculation, I get 55.9 kilonewtons for a KD of 1. And so you remember when I have my load combinations, um, for KD equals 1, I only have one load case, and that's case 3A. Okay, and so I need to check against um, this VF here, 6.5. That's the VF for a load case where my KD equals 1.0. Greater than VF of 6.5. Therefore, okay. Okay, so now I can do the same thing for um, my short duration load and my long duration load. So I'm gonna call those SHT for short, LNG for long. This one, okay, so the shear resistance equation is linearly proportional to KD. 
because KD is just within FV. So this is just going to be VR standard times 1.15 for the KD short duration, and I get 64.2. And for the long duration, I get VR standard times 0 0.65, and that's 36.3. And now if I go back to my load combinations and take the highest shear loads for each of those different KD factors, I'm going to get 47.6 here. And so this is KD equals 1.15, KD equals 0 0.65. I'm going to get 47.6 and 2.8 for the long duration. So these are both okay. Now, uh, you know, if I get into trouble, I can check VF at D from the support. But in this case, VF at D from the support is going to be the same as VF because what does the VF look like? If I go all the way back up to my shear uh, diagrams, uh, you can see here the shear is constant for um, my dead end snow load. And for my wind load, the total shear, um, you know, like if I check at, if I check at the support, oops, if I check at the support or if I check at D from the support, my shear doesn't change. So I don't get any benefit from checking at D. Like I don't get any benefit from ignoring the shear that's within D from the support because the shear is the same at D from the support as it is at the support. The maximum shear does not change. Okay, so I'm not actually going to do the detailed shear check because um, now that I have a, um, a shear coming from the eccentric load, I'm not going to be able to find a CV value that's going to work for it. And I don't want to bother right now to go through the practice of calculating CV from scratch. So let's just leave it with the detailed method for now. If you want to see how to do the, sorry, the simplified method, if you want to see how to do it with the detailed method, then um, you know check one of the other videos where I do that calculation fully. Okay, so now that we have the longitudinal shear, let's check the longitudinal shear for the compression side notch. Okay, so for compression side notch, I have to find my EC, which is my notch length. In this case, um, if I am looking at my notch length, my notch length basically goes from the inner edge of the support to the end of the notch. This is my EC here. Okay, so it's 400 millimeters um, minus the 175 millimeters. Okay, and there are uh, there are two different ways to calculate this. As you'll see, see in the notch shear video, um, or the shear video for glue lamb, um, and it depends on whether EC is less than D or EC is greater than D. And Actually, there are two um, different criteria depending on whether you're using the 08614 or the 08619. So this is the 08614 criteria, and this is the 08619 criteria. Uh, we want to see whether EC is less than D or whether it's less than D minus DN, which is the depth minus the notch. So it's basically the remaining depth. Um, and if it is, then we use one equation, and if it's greater than that, then we use a different equation. So what is our D? Our D equals um, 304 millimeters. So therefore, EC is less than D. That's correct. Okay, and our D minus DN equals 304 minus 0 0.2 times 304, because our notch depth is 20% of the depth, and we get um, 243 millimeters, um, which still satisfies the same condition. So we're going to use the same equation um, regardless of which code we're going to use. But you can see that if I was kind of in between those two criteria, then um, I would use a different equation uh, depending on which uh, version of the standard I'm using. Okay, so what is our KD for this check? We are going to look at basically the KD for where we have um, some significant shear force, and that is really only um, number four. Okay, I can check all of these, but I think in this case it's so clear that case four is going to govern 
the other ones are not even close. So case four is definitely going to govern here, and all of case four is um, using a KD of 1.15. So that's the one I'm going to check. Okay, so our phi factor is 0 0.9. Our FV is um, 1.75 times 1.15. You know, times one times one times one, and I get 2.01 MPA. Our dn, which is our notch depth, which is going to come into this equation, is 0 0.2 times 304, which is 60.8 millimeters. And our an, which is basically our remaining depth after we get rid of the notch is equal to 42560 millimeters squared. Okay, so now we can calculate our VR, and this is the VR equation for when EC is less than D. And if I calculate all that out, I'm gonna get 52.4 kilonewtons. And you recall that my VF was 47.6. That's the worst case VF for all of the case four shear values. So therefore, VR is less than VF, and we are okay. But it's a close call. I mean, we're only off by, uh, you know, three, four kilonewtons. Um, so it's close, but it's fine. I mean, it's fine that it's close, but that probably does mean that if we had gone one beam size down, it wouldn't have worked. In fact, if we did use the next beam size down, which is a 175 by 266, the VR for that would have equaled 44.3, which would not have satisfied my VF. Okay, so this is the minimum size based on the shear strength, considering that we have these notches. Okay, so longitudinal shear and longitudinal shear taking into account the compression side notches are both fine. Let's go ahead and do the moment resistance now. We are pretty confident about this. We're just gonna actually check it explicitly. Because we already saw from the table what the strength is. Okay, so this is 0 0.95 factor. My capital FB um, is gonna equal, you know, the same thing as usual. KD, KH. Okay, so I'm going to find this for KD equals 1.0 to start. I need all three. So I'm going to start by finding FB for KD um, equals 1.0 and modify it later. Okay, my KX, which is my curvature factor, is 1.0 because this is not a curved beam. My KZBG, this is my really fun size effect equation for bending glue lamb. Remember, is 130 divided by B, which is 175, all to the 1 tenth. Then I have 610 divided by D, which is 304, all to the 1 tenth. And 9100 divided by 3000, all to the 1 tenth. And if I multiply all that out, I get 1.163, which is less than 1.3. So it's okay, that's our KZBG value. Okay, so now what about KL? Well, for glue lamb, we have a 2.5 to one limit. And if my aspect ratio is within the 2.5 to one limit, then I can just say right away that KL equals one. which it is in this case, and therefore KL equals 1.4 um, for this problem. Okay, so now we can calculate our moment resistance. Remember that for um, glue lamb, we have two moment resistance equations we have to check. And we take the minimum of the two. I'm checking it for standard um, load duration first.
And for the first one that uses the size effect factor, we get a strength of 72.2 kilonewton meters. And for the second one, we use KL instead, which in this case is 1.0. And we get 62.1. Okay, so the one with KL is less, which makes sense because KL is less than KZBG, the size effect factor. So this is the one for KD equals one. And that is less than, sorry, greater than our MF for KD equals one, which is 19.5 uh, kilonewton meters. That's from 3A, from load case 3A. Okay, so now um, since I don't have my KL, since my KL equals one, Basically, my, my moment resistance equation is linearly proportional to KD again, um, just like my shear equation was for this case. So if I want to find the uh, moment resistance for long-term and moment resistance for short-term loads, I can just multiply my moment reaction, my, um, my governing moment resistance here by 1.25 or by 0.65. Now, if KL was not equal one and I had to calculate it, then usually FB, capital FB, which contains KD, um, is, is uh, built up in those equations as well. So KD comes into play in the FB, and then it would also come into play in the KL, which means that it wouldn't be linearly proportional if that was the case. But if KL equals one, then it is linearly proportional. So I can easily find um, the other moment resistances. Okay, so I can find that for the short-term load and for the long-term load, what are my MRs? And I can compare those to my MFs. So for the short-term load, the maximum MF for any load case was 42.1. So that's fine, and that's from 4A. And for the long-term load, it's from case one, which had 8.4 kilonewton meters. That's from case one. So these are all good. Every single moment resistance um, is greater than every single um, applied moment. Okay, so I'm gonna take another cut here. In this video, we looked at um, starting our resistance checks. We looked at shear, longitudinal shear, longitudinal shear, including the compression cutout, the compression notch, compression side notch. And then we looked at moment resistance. And in the next video, we're gonna look at the rest of the resistances, compression, tension, and um, also bearing.